Hey guys, welcome to the Frontline Community Church Podcast. My name is David Dorner, and I am the teaching pastor here at Frontline in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and it is so good to be with you. Our mission in this world is to see zero people unchanged by Jesus. So whether you've been following Jesus for a lifetime or if your journey's just begun, we hope that this message will speak powerfully to your heart, that it will reveal something that God desires to cultivate in your life, and that you'll be drawn to the person of Jesus as a result. We hope these next few moments encourage you, challenge you, and inspire you to be who God has created you to be. We hope you enjoy it. Well, if you're just joining us over the last few weeks, we've been working through a series, Returning to Our Vision. And so our vision as a church, we say Frontline is not done until there are zero lives living unchanged for Jesus. We're not done as a church until there are zero lives unchanged for Jesus. And so what we've been doing is every week we've been looking at a different conversion story in the book of Acts. So these are five different lives that were changed by Jesus and their story of how they were changed by Jesus in the book of Acts, where Jesus literally says to his disciples, you are my witnesses. That's what you're, that's what you're going to be into all the world. And so with each one of these different conversion stories, we're looking at a different one of our five zeros as a church. These are five marks of discipleship. Five things we believe happens in our lives and in our community and in our church when the gospel infiltrates. And so that's what we're looking at. So today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be in Acts 10. So if you've got your Bible app or your Bible, you can turn there. We're going to be looking at the life change story of Cornelius. And we are going to be looking through the lens of zero lost people. That's the zero we're looking at today is zero lost people. Uh, When Jesus went to call his disciples... You can find that story in the Gospels. He went and he stood on the Sea of Galilee. And his first disciples that Jesus called were fishermen. And what Jesus did not say was, come and follow me. That's actually not what he said. We we think that's what he said. We quote him as if that's what he said. But that's actually not what he said. When Jesus stood on the Sea of Galilee, what he actually said was, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of people. That's what he actually said. Similarly, at the end of Jesus' ministry, after his resurrection, he gathered all his disciples together. And in Matthew 28, you find the passage that we refer to as the Great Commission. It was Jesus' instructions for the church on what the church was to go and do. And Jesus says, go into all the world and be disciples. No, that's actually not what he said. Again, we act like that's what he said. We behave as if that's what he said. But what Jesus actually said was go into all the world and what? Make disciples. That's what he actually said to do. Now, here's why that's important. It's important because it's actually not an option to be a secret follower of Jesus. That's not a category that Jesus actually had. It's not an option he actually made available to us is that you could be kind of like a secret follower of Jesus, like kind of keep it quiet. Um, Now, that's not really true of anybody else in our world. I can be a secret follower of anybody else in our world, and they're going to be just completely fine with that. I'll give you an example. Who's this right here? The Biebs, yes. So, (laughs) yes, this is Justin Bieber right here. Okay, now Justin Bieber... If I decide I want to be a secret follower of Justin Bieber, he's going to be completely fine with that. I can, complete, I can pretend like I'm not a fan of his and I can secretly stream his music. I can sign up for his fan club using a fake email. I can get a giant poster of him and put it up in my bedroom. It'll annoy my wife, Carrie, but there you go. And I can completely deny publicly that I'm a fan of Justin Bieber. I don't even know who that is. I don't, I don't like his music. And you know what? Justin Bieber is going to be completely fine with that as long as the money keeps rolling in, he's going to be completely fine with that. But Jesus is not like that. Jesus did not leave us that option. In fact, what Jesus says is if you're ashamed of me before people, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. So so the theological truth we're looking at this morning as we go into our story is this idea that we are called to live our faith and share our faith. Yes, we're called to live our faith in Jesus, but we are also called to share our faith. The invitation of discipleship was come follow me and I will make you fishers of people. 
That's the invitation of discipleship. Now, here's uh, what the problem is with this. In fact, it's why a lot of you are feeling nervous right now when you, when you see that sentence. Now, the reason we feel nervous about this is because there's this dominant kind of thinking, dominant narrative in our culture, and I would say also in the church, and that's this statement right here. It's okay to be a Christian, just don't try to convert anyone. That's the way our world thinks right now. It's okay to be a Christian. That's fine if you want to be a Christian. Just don't try to convert anybody else. The church is no longer looked at as a positive influence in society and in individual people's lives, especially in the last few years. That wasn't true 30, 40 years ago, but that's true now. Whether it be because of the failings and the faults of Christian leaders or you know, because there's particular anger over the traditional Christian view of sexuality and marriage, but more and more, people are just kind of saying, okay, it's fine. You be a Christian. Just don't try to convert anybody. Don't, try to, don't share your faith. Don't do that. And I got to tell you, like, I feel that pressure too. It, it, it would be much easier to just be kind of like a secret follower of Jesus. But, but if I could, there's a logical fallacy with that whole argument of, hey, it's okay to be a Christian, but just don't try to convert people. Here, here it is. <laughs> to say, hey, it's not okay to have absolute religious truths is actually an absolute religious truth. <laughs> yeah, do you see that? Uh, logically, the problem is if you say, hey, don't push your views on other people, well, that's you pushing your views then on me of whether I should be able to share my views with other people. You see, what it, see the problem logically with that? And, and so really, we're all pushing our views on other people. That's what we do. That's what we are doing. Everybody's doing that. It's just some people can admit it. Some people can't. And so we feel that pressure. It's okay to be a Christian, but just don't, don't try to convert people. Don't share it. And I would tell you, in our story today, Simon Peter, one of the first disciples who was leading the church, Peter felt that pressure too. He felt that sense of, man, is, is it okay to share my faith? Can't I just remain kind of a secret follower of Jesus? And so we're going to look at this story today in Acts chapter 10. What's happened up to this point in the story, the first nine chapters of the book of Acts, nobody is getting saved except Jewish people. It's only Jewish people in the area of Judea and that, that surrounding area. Those are the only people who are coming to faith in Jesus Christ, only Jewish people. And so Cornelius is actually referred to as the first Gentile convert. He's the first non-Jewish convert to Christianity that begins this wave of the gospel going forward into all the nations. Let's take a look here. This is verse 1. It says this, In Caesarea there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about 3 o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened and he sent them off to Joppa. Now, if we could, for just a moment, let's, let's take a moment and let's just talk about Cornelius. Because the text goes into all this great detail about this character, Cornelius. And what we learn about Cornelius is that he is a really good dude. He's a really good guy. Lots of verses keep going through and through telling us how good he really is. It tells us he's a Roman centurion. which This, this would have been a Gentile soldier. Centurion meaning a hundred. So he would have been over a regiment of a hundred other soldiers. And doing his, his job. Now you say, well, well, that's not all that great if you think about that time. But he, it also says he was a devout man who was a God-fearer. The actual word there is proselyte. These were Gentile people who had come to believe in the God of Israel, the God of the Old Testament. But they hadn't become full Jewish people like they weren't circumcised and they weren't following the Jewish ceremonial law. But they believed in the God of Israel, the God of the Old Testament. It also tells us his household followed him. So he had gotten rid of all the Greco-Roman pagan household gods that would have been in every home in that time for any Gentile person. And he had led his household to actually follow the God of Israel and to be a God-fearer as well. 
And then also it tells us he was a giver. That he cared about the poor and that he gave generously to them. How many Christians can you say that about? And not only that, it tells us he had a devout prayer life. He had this regular prayer life where he regularly paused and he would pray to God. He was a really, really good guy. So it tells us all that. So the question then is, what was he missing? What was Cornelius missing, right? Because that's the whole point of the story. That's the reason we're talking about him is because is not he was such a good guy. That's the end of the story. Something's missing in his life. Something's not right. He needs something. And, and what the story is about to tell us is that what Cornelius needs is he needs to repent of his sin. He needs to believe in Jesus as his Savior, and he needs to get baptized. His goodness, it goes on and lists all these great things about him. His goodness was not enough to save him. The Bible is telling this message to us over and over and over again. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 64, 6, he actually says, all of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags to God. All of our best efforts, all of our good deeds, I hesitate to even tell you this, but the the actual reference to filthy rags was a reference to dirty menstrual cloths. That's the imagery that's being conjured up there. All your righteous deeds, all your best efforts, all your good works are like filthy rags to God. Um, this past spring, it was actually the day before Mother's Day, the Saturday right before uh, Mother's Day. Um, my wife Carrie and I were standing in the kitchen of our house. We were about to walk out the door to get in our car to go to our son Andrew's track meet. Now, if you've ever gone to a high school track meet, you know those things go on for hours and hours and hours. So we're about to leave the house for several hours. And so it's the day before Mother's Day. And so what I had said to my boys is I said, hey, guys, you need to have a Mother's Day present ready for your mom, right? She's not my mother. She's your mother. Your job is to make sure you have a a Mother's Day present for your mother. Now, our 15-year-old son, Aaron, did not have a Mother's Day present yet for his mom. And we're about to leave for several hours. And so, uh, because Aaron is on the autism spectrum, he's very literal. Like, he takes things very, very literal at face value. Whatever you say to him, he takes it literally. And so, we're standing there in the kitchen. And Carrie had said this once or twice before. But right before we walk out the door, she says, she's looking around the kitchen. She says, you know, I'd really love to paint this kitchen someday. And then she just leaves. And so we get in the car and we leave for several hours. And as soon as we leave, Aaron says, I know what to get mom for Mother's Day. So he marches downstairs. He grabs a can of paint, just a can of paint and a paintbrush. And he walks back upstairs and he just begins to paint the kitchen. And he's just, he's going for it. And he's thinking to himself, man, this is great. Mom's going to be so happy. Wait until she sees her Mother's Day present. And he just goes for it. I'm going to show you one picture, okay? Just just one picture. (laughs) So several hours go by. He makes great progress. We walk in the door, and he's standing there with the bucket of paint and the paintbrush, kind of like, (laughs) ta-da! He was expecting one reaction for us, but when Carrie and I look and we see the paint dripping down the walls onto the trim, onto the flooring, over our our countertops, smeared around our cabinets, instead of the reaction we were looking for, that he was thinking we were going to have, we had a completely different reaction. We freaked out. And we were like, oh, get the towels. So we run and we get the towels and we're trying to mop. You hurry before we, it dries, you know, we're trying to mop up all the countertops and trying to get it off the cabinets, everything. And he's just kind of standing there like, What? That is such a great picture of us with God when it comes to our sin, when it comes to our awareness. Here we are, we're painting away for God. We're doing these great good deeds for him. Like, man, I'm going to church. Ah, oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing like good deeds. I'm trying to be a good person. Yeah, I mess up sometimes, but then I say I'm sorry. See, I'm such a good person. And we have no idea how messed up we really are. We have no idea how broken we really are, how broken our world actually is because of our sin and our brokenness. See, a lot of times what I think happens is when we, when we talk about lost people, whenever we talk about zero lost people, a lot of times what we think about, when we think of a lost person, 
our mind goes to like this really, like the most horrible bad person doing really, really bad things that we can think of. Like Adolf Hitler. We say, yeah, that was, that's a lost person. That's what a lost person is. But actually, according to the Bible, we can be just as lost in our goodness as we can in our badness. Our good deeds, even our best efforts, even our best attempts are like filthy rags. See, that's where Cornelius was. That's where Cornelius lived. Even in his best efforts, even in his good works, he had no idea what he was missing. You know, what's interesting is, um, you know, we love Aaron. Carrie and I, like, like we love our, our boy. Like, there's nothing he could ever do, you know, to make us stop loving him. And actually, after we all calmed down, I wish I had responded a little bit better, but after we calmed down, uh, we have, we've actually had some really good laughs about that. I mean, he's laughed about it too, after we've kind of just talked about the whole painting the kitchen thing. But here was the problem. We couldn't just accept, even though we loved him, we couldn't just accept our flooring and our, our trim and our countertops and our cabinets the way they were after that. Someone had to come in at the expense of their time and their money. It was actually our friend Mandy Miedema and had to actually paint over those walls and clean up those things. That's what Jesus did for us. The gospel is that Jesus entered into our brokenness. He entered into our mess, became a human being. And then just like we were singing about a moment ago, it was his blood shed on the cross that covered our sins. See, see, that's the gospel message. And if you don't understand it, it's almost like it punches us in the gut and then it hugs you. It, it offends you with this, net, with this message that actually no matter how good you are, even your best efforts, your best good works have, are not enough to save you. They've completely separated you from God. And yet, there's this immediate embrace. It also draws you into this embrace that God loved you so much and so passionately and so greatly that Jesus came and offered himself on our behalf. It offends you and it draws you in. That's what Cornelius is missing. Let's keep going in the story here. It says this, The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Now, if we could, we just stopped and we talked about Cornelius for a moment. So let's do that same thing with Peter. Let's stop. Let's talk about Peter for a minute. What we learned from this text is that Peter, he's also a really good dude. He's a really good guy. What we know about him is that he's a devout Jew. Now, the reason he didn't want to eat those animals that were lower down on that sheet in the vision it's because those animals were unclean. For a, for a devout Jewish person who was trying to follow the law and obey God, you would never eat those animals. And so we know he's, he's committed. He's a devout Jew. Also, it tells us he has a really great prayer life. It says he goes up on the roof every day at noon to pray. He had this regular rhythm with God where he got away from, you know, the stress and the burden of life to just go and just to be with the Lord. So he's following Jesus. And then the, the next thing we know is that he knows the gospel. This is Simon Peter, who Jesus had called, who, you know, to one of his first disciples. He'd followed Jesus for three years. He'd witnessed Jesus' death on the cross. He'd been a witness to his resurrection. And, and he knows the gospel. He knows what it means to have his faith in Jesus. So the question then is, what was he missing? This story isn't just about what Cornelius was missing. This story is also here to show us what Peter was missing. There's something missing in his life as well. And what Peter is missing is Peter needs God to expand his vision for who in his world, who in his relational context needs the gospel. That's what he's missing. He, he's living a life right here in this little box. Up to this point in the book of Acts, it's only Jewish people in this area of Judea that have accepted Christ and become Christians. He needs God to expand his vision for who needs the gospel. That's what the sheet was all about. 
And so what happens next, if I can just kind of give you a summary of this incredible story in the Bible, what happens is Peter comes down from the roof after having this vision and the three guys come from Caesarea. They arrive there in Joppa at Simon the Tanner's house and they start talking to each other and they're like, hey, uh, you're Peter. I think you're supposed to come with us. And Peter's like, yeah, I just had this vision. I think I am supposed to come with you. So they leave Joppa, they go to Caesarea and they get to Cornelius's house and Peter actually goes in the home of Cornelius. Now, this is something you would never do as a devout Jewish person. The second he crosses over that threshold, he has done something that would have been forbidden by the law. He's put himself in the home of a Gentile person. And as he does that, he realizes, oh, you know, God has sent me to share the gospel, to preach the gospel to Cornelius and to his household. And so they have this conversation about, yeah, isn't it weird that God, you know, an angel appeared to me and sent, I sent these three guys to you. And yeah, isn't it weird that God spoke to me in a vision? And so Cornelius finally just says, okay, so what is it that you're supposed to tell us? Like, share with me. You're, you're here. What is it that I'm missing? What is it that I'm supposed to know? Verse 34, then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of gospel for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Now, he preaches the gospel to him. Now, I want you to notice, he says, this is the message of the gospel for who? For the people of Israel. He's not talking to someone who's a part of the people of Israel. So he's like, well, I guess I'm supposed to tell you about the promises for me and my people. So this is the, this is the good news of the gospel. It's, uh, you know, for the people of Israel that Jesus is the Messiah. And here's what happens next. Cornelius and his whole household, they immediately, they're cut to the heart when they hear that message. They surrender their lives to Jesus. They ask Jesus to be Lord of their lives. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit shows up in their house, just like he did on the day of Pentecost. So just like it did in Acts 2 with the Jewish people when the Holy Spirit showed up, in the same way the Holy Spirit showed up in Cornelius' house for these Gentile people. Now, if you're Peter, you're just, you're like blown away right now. You're falling down. Like what in the world? This could actually happen for Gentile people too? And then what happens is all of them, the entire household of Cornelius and his family, they all get baptized. It ends with this huge, the story ends with this huge celebration they're getting baptized and the Holy Spirit has come and now the movement of the gospel going forth to all the nations has begun. So as we turn this story toward ourselves a little bit this morning, as we, okay, as we say, okay, what does God want to say to us this morning? I, I would tell you, I think there's two groups of people that this story specifically speaks to. First group of people, whether you're watching online, whether you're here in this room, some of you are like Cornelius. You're a good person. You're going to church. Maybe you're, in fact, maybe you're even watching online right now. Maybe you're here in this room because you've been thinking to yourself, man, I need, there's some stuff in my life I need to do better. And so I need to get my butt to church. And so maybe you just got here to church. And you're, you're trying to be good. You're trying to do the right things. You're trying to, you know, say you're sorry when you mess up and do the wrong things. But it's all about you and your own effort trying to be good enough. And what you need this morning is the same thing that Cornelius needed. You need Jesus. You need to come to this place where you realize that you can be just as lost in your goodness as you can in your badness. You need to surrender your life to Jesus. You need to let him have your life. Make him Lord of your life. And what he promises is that he will enter in. He will save you. That he'll be the covering for your sins. And that it will be him that leads you in your life. And this abiding relationship with Jesus. It's our greatest source of hope and security and salvation. That's the first group of people. The second group of people, you're like Peter. You know the gospel. And you have an abiding relationship with Jesus. But you need God to expand your vision for who in your world needs Jesus. You need God to expand your vision and show you who in your relational context is close to you in proximity but is far from God. The language we've used over the, uh, over the years, um, whenever we've talked about zero loss people, is this question, who is your one life? And if you're newer to Frontline, you probably haven't heard this statement before. If you've been a part of Frontline for a long time, you've heard it before. It's this idea of who is your one life, to keep asking ourselves the question, who is that one life, that one person in my relational context? Maybe it's a 
neighbor. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a, a coworker. Maybe it's somebody who lives in the dorm. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's like a relative or a family member. Who is that one person that God is sending you to that is close to you but is far from God? I love this story. Don't miss it. It's, it's about one person being sent to one other person who needs the gospel. I mean, yes, there are those big moments where Peter preaches and 3,000 people come to know Christ, but far more often what you see over and over again is how did the church spread? It was one person sharing the gospel with one other person. It was one person going to another. Who's your one life? Who's that, who's that person that God wants to send you to? Who's your Cornelius that God wants to tap you on the shoulder and send you to go be the messenger of the gospel to? This is how people come to know Christ. This is how the gospel is spread. I want you to take a look here. This is, um, we're going to watch a video. Uh, it's a few minutes long. It's actually a testimony video. It's from my friend, uh, Craig Raymond. And um, Craig works for the GLR, the Great Lakes region of the Wesleyan Church that we're a part of. And so um, I love this video. He's just sharing a little bit of, about the impact of one person's life sharing the gospel with another and the legacy that can create and the life change that can create. Take a look. Just investing, taking a risk, having the courage to share Christ, to invite somebody to church, taking the time to have them over your house and mentor and disciple them, what kind of ripple effect that that would have. It's probably 1942, 1943, Traverse City, Michigan. My great-grandma, Rena Bell, and great-grandpa, Gilbert, they were in their late 20s, had both grown up with high priority on values and good morals, no relationship with Jesus, no church attendance. I hear a lot of stories about my great grandpa uh, being a chain smoker, having quite an affinity to curse words. They met this gentleman who also happened to be a pastor who was a handyman helping them out. Just makes an intentional decision to reach out to them and shares the gospel with my great grandma and she gave her life to Christ right there. So then they, they start going to church, the pastor continues to reach out to, and, and my great grandpa starts coming to church, but he wasn't nearly as open or receptive. It, it took him a little while. And one day uh, before church starts, the lead pastor says to my, my great grandpa, hey, Gib, when are you gonna give your life to Christ? And my great grandpa, right then, he said, he said, right now, and they walked to the front, the altar before the service had even started, and he gave his life to Christ. But Reverend Drummond is this pastor's name. Reverend Drummond and his wife personally discipled and mentored my great-grandparents. So not only does this pastor take a risk, have the courage to share the gospel and invite my great-grandparents to church and to follow Jesus, but then spent countless hours just discipling and mentoring them. That decision uh, has created a, a legacy in our family. I started feeling like God was calling me to ministry and I wanted nothing to do with it. I mean, no. I, no. The answer was a hard no. So I was out. I, I say, I remember distinctly having this conversation with God. Like, I still believe you're real. I still believe your word is true. I just don't want to follow you. So I'm out. I'm going to do what I want to do. I ran away hard for two or three years. I was really pretty efficient at wrecking my life. But it was in those moments that I knew that my family was praying. I knew my family was praying for me. I even go back to my great grandma. There was just a very real sense for me, even in those rebellion days, that she was praying and that God was pursuing me. Before I hit rock bottom, he got my attention. And I just said, God, whatever days I have left are yours. 
I'll do whatever you want me to do. It's the example of Reverend Drummond. It's the example of my great grandparents and my grandparents and my parents living this out. And that certainly propels me forward in what God's called me to. Reverend Drummond has no idea the impact that he's had on my life, that he's had to the fourth generation and now the fifth generation. He helped start a church in Madison, Wisconsin, and he has no idea. But there's times where I think about, what if he didn't? The legacy could have been much different. And even the opportunity to lead my daughter to Christ and to watch her very early in her life take steps down the same journey with Jesus. The story God has woven for me and our family is a story of just simply going after the mission. What's really compelling is the changed legacy, is the churches that get started after I'm gone, and the families that come to Christ and are changed to the fourth and the fifth generation because of a simple investment, a risk I took to pray with my neighbor, a risk I took to share the hope I have in Jesus, that that could have an exponential multiplication effect on the kingdom. And I just have to show up and be obedient. I just have to show up and be willing and take the risk. If I could go back today and talk to Reverend Drummond, I would just say, thank you. His willingness to take the risk, to take the time, has made all the difference in my life. It's easy to watch a, a video like that and just say, yeah, but, but he was a pastor. Or to read Acts 10 and say, yeah, but that was Simon Peter. I, I've, I've told you, if you've been a part of Frontline, you've heard my story before. It was actually my middle school principal. First day in a new town, my mom drops me off at, uh, middle, at, at the first day in this brand new school, at a middle school. She's walking out the door and she just bursts into tears. Life was a mess. She and my dad were not in a good place. The whole move had been so hard. She doesn't know anybody in town. And it was actually my middle school principal who God puts in her path, meets her right at the door. She's walking out. And he just begins to talk with her. And he, and he, and he says, hey, you know, you should, you should come with me and my family to church. You're new here in town. You don't know anybody. Might as well. And then we came and, and believe it or not, we actually did come to church and and. For that next year, I sat with my middle school principal. And within a year, all of us had gotten baptized and accepted Christ. One invitation, one person, not that, that one invitation with my mom at that door in the middle school changed the trajectory, not just of my life, but of my eternity. That's the power of this. To just say, God, send me to begin to say, God, who is it? Who is my one life? Who is that person that you want to send me to? And just to begin to pray for them and look for ways to just serve them and speak to them. Would you pray with me? And so, Lord, we just go to you right now. And we just recognize that there is an invitation on the table for each one of us. For some of us right now, the invitation is to come to you, Jesus. For the first time, for some of us, maybe we've been in church, maybe we've been trying to be good, maybe we've been trying on our own effort and we feel bad that we, that we keep messing up, that we keep not having it together. Or maybe there's just some things that are too big for us that we've run up against that we can't fight in our own power. 
And so this morning, Jesus, we recognize the good news of the gospel is that we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be, it's not our goodness that saves us. And so this morning, Jesus, we entrust our lives to you. We just ask you to be Lord of our lives. We ask you to come in and just to cleanse us and to give us that new resurrection life in you. For others of us, God, the invitation is to literally say, yes, Lord, I'll I'll be sent. Would you show me? Who is it that you want me to to go to? For some of us in this room, for some of us watching online, you already know. God's already laying on some of your hearts exactly who that one person is that he wants to send you to. So God, right now, we just begin to pray for those people. We just begin to pray for that one life, that one person that you want to send us to. Would you open up doors for the gospel to go forward? Would you show us how to tangibly love them? Would you show us how to stand in the gap and how to be people who just testify to your goodness in our lives and what you've done? Thank you for this invitation, God, that you, that you invite us to come and follow you. For some of us this morning, that's what we need to do is just to come and follow you and let you save us. But thank you, God, that, that you don't just stop there. That you, you say, come follow me and I will make you into a fisher of people. We just say yes to that invitation today. It's in Jesus' name, everybody said.